Good morning. Grace and peace to all of you from our living Lord Jesus Christ. We've gathered together this morning to worship Him in spirit and in truth. I, I, I've got to tell you, it's been the most awkward thing in the world to try to videotape the last three weeks. I can't tell you how awkward that's been for me. I know there's a lot of pastors out there that have been doing it for a year now and do just a fantastic job and I gained a great deal of respect for the work that they've been doing in uh, keeping the word going out to their churches. It's great to be back in in-person worship here at the Federated Church. For those of you who are watching a little bit later today online, we're glad you're with us as well. We're glad that you're here. We hope that the worship service today is enlightening to your body, mind, and spirit, that it speaks to you, that God would speak to you and give you peace and understanding in this day. Amen. We will be having communion this morning, so if you're at home, you can have, take a, just a moment here or maybe during one of the songs and make sure that you get a piece of bread or a cracker or that you would get uh, something to drink. It's not important. You don't have to have any special bread or special juice or anything, but um, go get a couple of elements for our time of communion, and we are with you in spirit uh, no matter what time that you're taking that. Uh, we will be having in-person worship from here on out. Quite a thing for it to be a below zero morning when we've come back, but that's the way God had planned it. We'll also be, um, have to make the annou announcement. We have an um, annual meeting coming up uh, two weeks from today. Is that correct? Two weeks from today? Three weeks from today, sorry. If you're watching the notifications and bulletins, I'm not great with dates and I hadn't written it down. So part of, part of what we do with annual meetings is we announce them ahead of time so everybody's here on the right day. We, as, as best as I understand, it'll be right after church. And um, if you can't make it to the meeting and want to participate, talk to one of the session members or give the church office a call. We'll see how we can get you in by phone or something along that line uh, if you want to have your voice and hear what's going on for that. Okay. All right, uh, we have gathered together. We're going to open our worship this morning then with Psalm number 84. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in the courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good things does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. What a beautiful word of the Lord to begin our morning. Let us pray. O Creator God, Yahweh the Eternal One, the beginning and end of all things, the Alpha, the Omega, we come to you this morning worshiping you with our hearts and our minds, even though our voices might be silenced, our hearts pour out our spirit to you. And we give thanks to you, Lord, that you pour out your spirit upon us just as you have promised in your word. That wherever we go, whatever we do, Jesus is indeed with us, holding us up, embracing us, keeping us warm, keeping us safe. We give such thanks and praise to you for the Spirit of God 
that you have given us. This morning, Lord, we give you thanks that your Spirit is here with us today. And not only with us, but all of your saints worshiping around the world today. Whether it's in this congregation or another, or an hour from now, or three hours, or five hours, our prayers and our praise go up endlessly from the earth. And with those who are watching this message later today, we are with them through your Spirit, and we give you such thanks and praise for that. So Lord, as we, as we worship, as we have the privilege to have, and freedom to have gathered back together here to this, this day, we give you thanks and we worship you. We give you thanks and praise, eternal God, for you are our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. Our God is a righteous God, a holy God, a God who can't stand in the presence of sin, which is why we come before Him as part of our worship, confessing our shortcomings, our sins before Him. It's through confession that we can unburden ourselves, allow God to work His healing within our lives, within our spirits. So please join me in your mind, or you at home with your words, in joining me in the prayer of confession. Great God of all creation, we bow down to you in awe. We are often speechless before you. Our words seem incomplete. Our thoughts seem incapable of recognizing you even when you come into our presence. Forgive our doubt, Lord. Forgive our haste to rely on our own knowledge and our own resources. Forgive our tendency to care for our own needs before the needs of others. Forgive us for turning a blind eye to the poor, the hungry, and the needy. Forgive us for our silence in the face of evil. Give us a new voice, Lord, and restore our heart to the remembrance of your saving sacrifice and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. I'd ask you then to join me in a time of silent prayer of confession.
Amen. We give thanks and praise that God's love and mercy is even greater than His judgment, even greater than all of our sin. Hear these words of assurance. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death He might destroy the one who has power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of love and mercy, we give you thanks once again for your spirit with us today. We pray that the words that we hear, the words that we speak, the scriptures that we hear, would speak not just to our ears, but they would speak to our mind, speak to our hearts, speak to our spirit, that you would reveal your truth through your word to us. We pray for a deeper understanding, a deeper awakening, a deeper presence from your spirit, that you would grant us the peace that we so desperately seek that you would give us comfort in these difficult times, that we would be uplifted, healed, and made whole through your word. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the uh, minor prophet Malachi. Malachi 3, beginning in verse 1. You have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in him whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver." And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. May God add his understanding to this reading of his word.
Sunday in Epiphany, technically, but there's one little known um, holiday, if you will, on the church calendar that we don't often recognize, not one of the more popular ones, called the Presentation of the Lord. And that's what we're going to look at today, is the Presentation of the Lord. And, and I would just like to mention, before I pass it over, is that the, the song we just heard, which I actually love that song, um, several people went to a great deal of work to make sure that that was part of worship this morning. So I really want to thank uh, Chris and Kristen and, and all of the tech people for making that happen because that song really speaks to me and it fits so well with the message of today. So thank you so much. Um, th this is a, a bit of a, a different time for uh, epiphany because we go back to the time when Jesus was a little baby. The presentation of the Lord is actually um, a part of the Mosaic law, the, the law of Leviticus. Moses instructed them that all firstborn male children, sorry women, this is just how culture was in that time, the firstborn male children were to be taken to the temple and presented to the Lord. They were be, to be dedicated to the Lord. And so this is what's happening in today's scripture. Mary and Joseph are bringing baby Jesus. It's 40 days after the circumcision, and they bring him back to the temple for the dedication ceremony. And you're going to find some of the language today really looks very familiar to what we do in baptism. For you Presbyterians, we do infant baptisms, and for Baptists, we often do um, infant dedications, if you will. And we, we see a lot of the same language. Uh, the couple comes, and they, they come up the aisle with the baby, and, and they hand him to the, the pastor, in our case, or in that case, the, the priest or the priestly figure, and the priestly figure takes the baby in the arms, and and there's water, it's a, it's a time of purification, and we have all the symbols of, of water, and we have, um, in their case, we had the sacrifice going on, and we don't do animal sacrifices anymore, but, 
but they, they did their sacrifices. They went through all of the, the tradition, the routine, the law, the pageantry of dedicating that child. And so we call it the presentation of the Lord because it's not just a dedication. Literally, we are presenting this baby to God. I know when Pastor Richie was here, he would like to take the baby and, and literally walk through the church so to show everybody up close the baby's face presenting the baby to the congregation as part of our tradition because the baby is not just somebody else. He's part of our church family. It's a presentation. There are other kinds of presentations. If, if somebody's getting an award, maybe an Academy Award or something, they go up on stage and they're presented with an award. And there's a lot of pageantry that goes with it. It's a, it's a public event. Maybe in a court of law, uh, you have, have a case to be made, and the lawyers get up and they present their case to the jury. And by, by presenting their case, it's not just an argument. They're speaking what they believe to be truth. At least we hope so in a court of law. They're presenting their case, and they're laying out, they're declaring the truth in a court of law. Maybe you're a salesperson and you have a, a new client and you want to sell them your product and so you go before them and you put up all your charts and your graphs and, and everything and you tell them everything wonderful about your product and you want to tell them everything truthful so that they understand fully what it is they're getting and try to convince them that everything you're saying is the truth and that it's well worth embracing what you're selling. And I've been thinking about these concepts of presentation as we look at today's Scripture. Let's see what uh, Scripture actually has to say about it. Luke 2, beginning in 22. And when the time had came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him, that is Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a young pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. The first part tells you the, the, the process that they went through of that we talked about, that uh, Mary and Joseph came up to Jerusalem and they went into the temple. And they came into the temple, they made their sacrifices. Now if they had been a wealthy couple, they would have sacrificed a lamb that day. But Jesus came out of poverty. He came out, he came out of the hum most humble of beginnings. And so for the poor people, it was a pair of young birds that were sacrificed. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, and this man was righteous and devout, having waited for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now it doesn't expressly say that he was a priest in the temple of the Lord, but clearly he had some authority in the Lord. It would be like if, if somebody brought their baby in to be baptized, um, not just some random person generally would stand up out of the congregation and take that baby out of their arms and stop start praying and coming up here, usually it's a person that's authorized to do those things, somebody with some authority. So they don't really call Simon a priest in this passage, but we get the impression that he may have been performing priestly duties in the temple. And Simon wasn't just any random guy. They do describe him, and he says, and this man was righteous and devout. Righteous and devout is how they, he had a long history of being dedicated to the Lord. He could be trusted in the temple because he was righteous. He was a good man in the eyes of the law. And he was devout. That means he had dedicated years and years and years and years of his life to the service of the Lord. He had a reputation amongst the people that knew he was to be trusted. That what he said and what he did in the temple was to be trusted. And I don't think those things are small descriptions here at all. I think they're critically important descriptions because if we're talking about the presentation of a product, and I hate to use that word, but the presentation is truthful. And for a presentation to be truthful, we have to be able to trust the person giving the presentation. And he was righteous and devout. And they say he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. 
He was waiting for the consolation. He wanted to see the salvation. He was waiting earnestly for the Messiah. And that takes an awful lot for somebody standing in the temple since it had been something like 2,000 years since Moses was alive. It had been a long, long time. A lot of the prophets like Malachi, the great passage we read, talking about that suddenly coming into the temple of the Messiah. That kind of prophecy had been read for five or six hundred years already and had never come true. So this was a guy that had a lot of faith. A lot of faith because he wanted to see it happen. And it says, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit of God was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. God promised him of the day that he was going to see the salvation of all Israel and all mankind. That's a pretty big promise to be carrying around in your spirit. Can you imagine if one of us kind of reading Scripture and says, Man, I really believe God's going to do that. I really, really believe it. And not have it be just out of our own desire, our own wants, our own needs, our own selfishness. But we just really believe that God told us that's going to happen. And so he came in the Spirit into the temple. When he came in the Spirit into the temple, being in the Spirit of God would, would suggest that he has already been spending a great deal of time in prayer and fasting. One doesn't normally just become in the Spirit walking around in the middle of the day. It comes by much prayer and fasting. And he had, comes into the temple already in the Spirit of God. And when the parents then brought in the child Jesus, he sees them coming in the door to do for him according to the custom of the law. See, Jesus' parents came in because this was the tradition. This is what you do. This is the law. You bring him to the temple for dedication. And that's all they really expected that that day was to take care of the sacrifice, have the prayers, have the presentation, and that would be the day. And yet Simon does something different. He took him up in his arms. And this is important. He blessed God and said, the very first thing that Simon does when he takes the baby Jesus into his arms, he doesn't say, see, I was right. I was right all along. No, the first thing he does is he falls into worship. He's in the Spirit of God. He takes the baby Jesus up and he says, and he blessed God. He blessed God. The first thing that he does is he blesses God in an act of worship. And Simon says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. He makes that profound declaration. Simon's presentation to the people is his word. God's promise has been fulfilled this day in the presence of all of you. And perhaps he even expanded it when he says a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. It's a glorification to the people of Israel because 2,000 years worth of prophecy is finally coming true. After centuries and centuries and centuries of oppression and defeat and coming and going and generations and generations, it's going to happen. It's happened. He's here. And his father and his mother, that's Mary and Joseph, marveled at what was said about him. Which is kind of amazing, you know, even considering what Mary and Joseph have been through in the last year, You'd think that not too much would surprise them anymore, but I also think that Mary and Joseph, even at this point with a newborn baby and after all they had been through, after the revelation, after how she came about being pregnant, that 
some of these things might not be too surprising, and yet they marveled at what was said about him. Because I'm sure that a young couple like that would have still had a lot of questions about what all this meant, about what God was really doing in their lives, what God had really intended for this baby. And they marveled at what was said about him. And Simon blessed them. He blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. That was kind of a curious comment. Not so much for the fall and rising. We would come to learn historically that many people were raised up in Jesus' name. And many people died not knowing Him because of His name. And for a sign that is opposed in parentheses, verse 35, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. I can almost hear him whispering that to Mary as a personal message. That a sword would pierce through your soul also. And I suspect that Mary had no real clue what that meant at the time. We can look back historically and understand perhaps what Mary must have felt standing at the foot of the cross, seeing her son crucified. I can vaguely recognize that that might feel like a sword piercing through her own soul also. So that, all of this happens so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The thoughts from many hearts might be revealed. Jesus has come to do all of this to reveal the thoughts of our hearts. Because revealing the thoughts of our hearts, both the good and and the ugly is where we find salvation in Christ. It's through the revelation of truth. It's for the exposing of the things that are hidden. Those are the things revealed. But he doesn't stop there because prophecy, prophecy usually requires solid confirmation. We should always be a little bit skeptical when reading prophecy, shouldn't we? About maybe is it going to happen right now the way this person said? And so there's a very interesting second part to the prophecy that's taking place at the presentation. Verse 36 says, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. Interestingly that God uses a woman in this passage after all the discussion perhaps about uh, women preaching in the temple and things like that, about all of the patriarchal culture that they lived in in that day. And so God in his beautiful, uh, humorous at times wisdom puts a woman there, a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow, she was 84 years old. And she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer, night and day. While I trust that that was actually her true story, that she had been married for seven years and then she was widowed, Jesus always had a very special place in his heart for widows. And, and then she spent the rest of her life, up to this time at age 84, in the temple, worshiping and fasting and praying night and day. And I think that's not only her physical history, but it's also a spiritual history as well. She had tried and fulfilled her place in the world seven years is a, is a number of completion in Scripture. And she had completed her time of living in the world as we live in the world. And she spent the rest of her life in the presence of God, in the temple, worshiping, fasting, and praying. And I actually love that God used a woman character for this particular role in this particular day. And coming up at that very hour, interesting she shows up that very hour while Jesus is being presented in the temple, isn't it? And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God. Her first action coming into the scene is she, she breaks into worship. She gives thanks to God. 
Her very first thing she does is to praise God and give thanks to God and to speak of Him who all were waiting for in the redemption of Jerusalem. The very first thing, she's probably quoting the prophet Malachi. I'm just making this up. There are a lot of prophets to quote. She's probably prophesying, saying, look, this happened. This has happened. This is happening. For all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Oh, patience is a beautiful thing, isn't it? We wait. We are such an impatient people. We wait for weeks and weeks thinking that something should happen. And maybe it's years from now. Maybe it's decades from now that it's going to happen. All in God's timing. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, And the favor of God was upon him. See, we really know very little about Jesus then for the next 12 years until they come back to the temple and picks the story up. But I think this is an incredible story of God presenting his son to us. And then the second part of that is the prophet and prophetess presenting the word to the people around them making declarations about who Jesus is, what's been fulfilled, how it fits with Scripture, that everything's right according to the Word of God. Then comes the difficult and hard part for me because I began to think about what is our presentation? What is our presentation to the people around us when we talk about Jesus? A lot of culture today is put off by the church. They say that we're hypocritical, that we hide within our religion, that we're religious in that one hour in church during the day, but the rest of the time out in the world, well, we don't really want to talk about that too much, do we? How do we talk about Jesus? How do we present ourselves? Do we act that way in our business dealings, in our personal dealings? Do we actually make some semblance of acting righteous? Or is that just something that we do in church? Do we talk about Jesus in ways that are putting off? Do we talk about Jesus in a way that focuses more on God's judgment and condemnation? Condemning people that aren't like us, that don't act like us, that are sinning differently than us? Why are other people's sins so much worse than our own? And yet, that's and whether that's true or not, that's very often how people perceive the church and how people very often perceive Christians. And every time we say something and do something out in the public world, we're actually presenting Jesus before them. Are we presenting him as one who saves? Do our actions present him as one who saves, as one who heals, as one who comforts, as one who brings peace? Or do we present ourselves as one who brings division, anger, hostility, greed? Tough questions, difficult questions, questions that don't just look at this story in a historical sense, but they make us take into account how do we present ourselves to an unbelieving public, to a skeptical public, to a public that says, you guys have been preaching this for 2,000 years and nothing's changed. The world's worse now than it's ever been. What good has Jesus done for our world today? People might ask. And if they ask, that's the time to tell them. This is how Jesus has made a big difference in my life. This is when he healed me. This is when he gave me comfort. When I couldn't take it anymore. When I couldn't do it anymore. When I couldn't stand anymore. This is is when this prophecy was fulfilled in my life. And that's why I can present myself with what I truly believe to be the truth. We talked about presenting truth in everything that we do. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
He didn't say, I just speak truth or act like truth. He says, I am the truth. God said, I am, that I am. Jesus says, I am the truth. And when we kind of get our arms around this, we return to Galilee. We return to the place that we started, to our own town. And that's the place where we grow and become strong, filled with faith and wisdom, so that the favor of God might be on us, us all. If we're going to be like Jesus, these words work for us too, don't they? Let us pray. God, fill us with faith and wisdom, grace and mercy, understanding and compassion. Lord, fill us with with a more powerful spirit that would understand the difficulties that so many people around us are facing. Father, open the doors for us that we might have the opportunity to share with struggling and hurting society how very real, how very powerful the spirit of truth can be. Lord, help us with the words to explain to those unbelievers that it's not just a ritual confession prayer, it's actually a submission to the Creator God. The release of all the baggage that we carry is liberating and healing. We pray for people now, Father, those struggling with COVID. Those who are well but are struggling from isolation, loneliness, depression. Those struggling in families that are breaking apart due to tension and financial tension. Abuse of all kinds unspeakable things. We pray for them, Father God, that you would send the appropriate intervention into circumstances to allow people to find that healing they need and so desperately seek. Lord, we pray for the members of this congregation and for families in our community that are struggling. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would come and bring an end to this time of wilderness that we find ourselves seemingly stuck in. Lord, we lift up to you so many today. We lift up caregivers, first responders, Our representatives in government, we ask that you would give them understanding. As a, as a society, we ask that you would let us lay aside our partisan differences and come together as human beings, one spirit of God, to find reconciliation and healing with, we, with each other and with you. And so now, Lord, as we pray together in our minds one prayer that the Lord has taught us, let us hear these words anew. Let us pray them in our spirits anew. Speak to us this common prayer anew that we might be transformed. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed and holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, O God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We begin our journey here at baptism, don't we? We come before God in the truth and understanding, allowing Him to purify our spirits, our minds, and our bodies. We dedicate ourselves to Him. And then at the fulfillment of times, Jesus sitting around the table with His disciples on that last evening. He gathered His disciples together and and prayed with them. Jesus prayed with them. And on that night, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless this bread to the nourishment of our bodies. This bread, which represents the body of Christ, we ask that you would bless it and make it holy. That as we partake of it, you would feed and nourish not only our bodies, but our spirit and minds as well. And then Jesus, showing what was to happen shortly, took that bread and he broke it the way his body would soon be broken. And he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Please take of the body of Christ. And we share one body. Likewise then, Jesus lifted up the cup. He says, this cup is my blood. It's the new covenant poured out for you. The new covenant of forgiveness and mercy. The old covenant was never satisfactory, never sufficient. The blood of bulls and lambs and goats and turtle doves will no longer be poured out for the sins of the nation. My own blood will be poured out for you. Every time that you drink of this cup, remember me. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink. For in this cup, you find your forgiveness. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this table that you have prepared for your people, for all people. You tell us that you've prepared a heavenly table for us, an abundant table. And we now pray for the millions and millions of people who don't know you. That there is enough at this table for everyone. We pray, Father God, that your Spirit would begin to draw people in. Draw them to your table, a place where they can be nourished and fed and refreshed and made whole and made full. For no one comes to the table alone. You're seated at the table together, the body of Christ. We pray that as we take the bread and drink of the cup that you would unify us with one body and one blood, one salvation, one Christ, one Lord. And that through these things we might be made strong and capable and nourished enough to go out and declare that mercy to others. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I now invite you to give. 
We do have baskets here to give uh, monetary donations, your checks and cash. We do invite you to give online, send your checks, cash to the office. We really appreciate it. Uh, the ministry of the church continues on. Mission work continues on. All of the work of the church continues on. And for that, we give such thanks to all of you who are here, all of you who are at home who continue to support the ministries of the Federated Church here in Sandwich. Amen. Give generously, and we recognize also that many ways the, that the body of Christ gives through their time and efforts and talents out in the community. And we, we want to respect and recognize that as well, that all of the acts of giving and selfless giving that you do in the community are acts to the Lord as well and, give, and gifts to God as well. So we give thanks for that. Spend some time then, uh, let's meditate for a moment on our time of giving to God in the church. Amen. Lord, we give thanks for the gifts, tithes, and offerings presented today. We give you thanks for your servants who are so generous with their lives, their time, their resources, and their love that they share with each other. What a gift and a great offering it is before your altar. Amen. Now as we go back into the world, take these words with you and let them give you peace. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Amen. Go in peace, brothers and sisters.